And I just accidentally covered chat. So hello, I have started streaming now. I see everybody in chat. I'm sorry I'm late, but let's be real. How often have I actually been on time for this class? Nay, 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 tens of thousands of years. People have come to me in search of what they desire most. All right. Hello, everybody. Oh, uh, sorry. I was just agreeing with my audio. I will introduce you. I'm trying. I'm not trying okay. to be rude. Um, yes. You have on your mind. I do. And for some reason, my sound refuses to go through my headphones. So that's fine. Uh, I'm not sure if chat can hear the sound, um, but now I can't. Um, but yes, uh, so today we have Dr. Thomas Malby with us. He is the one who wrote the article that everybody read and enjoyed for today. Um, he is also my former advisor. Uh, he is the reason I got a PhD. So I expect everyone to be super on the ball today, right? I'm not worried. You guys were great when Dr. Chen was here. Um, Mark Chen actually visited earlier in the semester. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite people. All those game scholars know each other. That's how that works. Um, That's right. Yeah, so please say hi to uh, Dr. Malby. And um, I don't know if you want to say anything else about yourself. I'm not I'm not sure. You've done a lot, so we don't have that much time to cover all the things. <laughs> well, I'll say something real quick. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Professor of Anthropology and Chair of the Anthropology Department at UW Milwaukee. Uh, and uh, mainly I've, I've written sort of in two areas. Once uh, my first stuff on uh, game playing, specifically gambling in Greece and how it helps us understand how people confront unpredictability in other parts of their lives. And then more recently, uh, things about online uh, platforms, uh, either game-like platforms or game platforms and relationship between the institutions that make them and the social action that happens in Well, impatient, aren't we? Like I said, a lot. He has done a lot. Um, all right, so um, before I start taking questions from chat, they have asked if they can pick our characters. Oh, sure. I may need some help with my controller on how I switch characters here. Ah, the um, he seeks ooh, his I haven't played with the controller in a long master. time. It's a journey filled <clears throat> so we are being asked to do the monk and the twins. And <laughs> monk and the twins, okay. Oops, sorry. So I should do the monk. There's got to be some way to switch here. Uh, you know what? I'm uh, going to pull up on my phone the cave controller. Ah, did I get the monk? I got the you monk. You did. All right, uh, we good? Yep. All right, excellent. Uh, let's do things. I think we go this way. It is, but it's been uh, a hot minute since I've played. Uh, no, we need the... Um... The crowbar. Yes, you've played this before, right? I played it with you. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was the last time I played it, in fact. Not that I didn't enjoy the game, but... Uh... All right. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, let's see. As we as we get this game going, uh, Chad's telling me that they are all sleepy. No, today is not the sleepy day. Um, this is still for credit, so you can start asking questions uh, now. I know that you guys miss spring break. I miss spring break too. Um, yeah, me too. Not that I had much of a break. Yeah, you had a spring break. We didn't. That's right. It, I bet the same thing happens to you, Crystal, that happens to me, which is that all the stuff like reviewing manuscripts or articles and things that I, I should do, but I can't find time to do, they pile up in a stack and then I do them during like spring break. Right. Um, I literally cannot remember which button actually uses the crowbar on the thing. I think it's E. Ooh. Is that right? E? It is. Five. I think I remapped these to use the keypad at some uh, point. Maybe not the best idea. Yes, Taco Cat. Question time. <clears throat> uh huh. I'm I'm all ears. Oh, 
Hopefully I won't die while I'm glancing at chat. I mean, of all the games though, this one is not that bad with the right. death penalty. That's true. Um, <clears throat> so I am going to talk a little bit. Um, Axdom, X, oh, you, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Um, you need to ask questions. It works the same as it did when Dr. Chen was here. Um, so you all need to, good morning, get your coffee. Come back to class. That's right. Careful. Um. If that bridge. Oh, I think we need a third character, don't we? Back up. And by if, we I mean when yes. So oh, oh, sure. I will go grab one. Ah, the time traveler. Uh, so everybody read Coding Control, right? Which uh, now in the making. feels like it was Fortunate written day. ages ago. Yesterday mm -hmm. is a new um, day. But uh, that's, that's where, where the questions are going to come from, right? Yes, that should be where it came from. Um, they also, um, and I, I apologize, I actually should have mentioned this earlier, um, they also have to play a game every week. And the game they played, uh, I'm not sure if you know it, it's uh, uh, Coming Out Simulator. Oh, uh, no. I don't think I've seen that one. Um, so we pl a okay. long time ago we played it on lunch zone. That's why I was like, maybe, maybe not. Maybe, uh, maybe. Is it? The, it's not. No, no. I remember the. Oh, is that the one that's like on a high, at a high school in like in like Southern California or no? No, I think you were thinking of Little Witch Story. Coming Out Simulator is um, a super small game by Nikki Case where you play through him trying to come out to his parents. Mm hmm. Um, oh, I see. Uh, oh, look, so we have some questions here. We do you have some um, questions? Oh, 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 are video game creators game obligated to give players certain freedom? Do players just accept the, the product and it's a free game like Second Life? No so, th no that's a, it's a rich question, um, even because in that question are already uh, at issue some really important um, uh, things about games and their makers. Uh, one of the ways that we typically make sense of uh, something like computer games is through a market kind of logic. Uh, now this goes back to the idea of the philosopher John Locke and I won't get into all of that, but uh, the question that there's something called the private Sphere. And within that, that private sphere, sphere um, our ethical obligations to each other are reducible to our contract obligations. Someone is a customer, you know, they, they engage in essentially a contract to purchase something or not, or, or partake of a service or not. Um, now, that is one way to try and frame the ethical obligations that we have as human beings is they oh, just it just maps onto our market obligations to each other. Uh, but that is only one set of ideas, um, and I think most people uh, in in the social sciences who look at this kind of thing end up being pretty skeptical about framing our relationship to each other in such transactionalist terms, as if all of our ethical obligations can be captured by a uh, kind of product-consumer relationship. So, are uh, computer game developers obligated? If they are, it it would be in one of two ways. Either one, you would say, as just human beings, there is we are we are never not uh, um, enjoined to be ethical to each other, and there are things beyond market considerations that come in. Or another way of saying, if you think they are obligated, say, well, I think they're obligated. Some political institution like a state, the government, reflecting the will of the people, should regulate those companies so that they will. Uh, follow their ethical obligations to the players, right? Um, so that I'm trying to unpack a bit what I'm seeing behind that question. I hope that that's helpful. Boy, a whole bunch of things have come in. Yeah, um, don't worry about it. We won't cover them all, but they know yeah. that. <laughs> okay. Um, let me see what else we have here from Taco Cat. Uh, do both Dr. Mallory and Dr. Mallory, for a large virtual world platform or content creation, the main purpose of, by the way, should I just drop out so I can read these? <laughs> 
If and, you, uh, uh, but I feel like there's a lot to get through, and I'm not able to control my uh, my character while I do it. You're you're much better at playing while you while you teach compared to me. Okay, if you want to drop out, that's fine. It is whatever you uh, can handle. Yeah, just for a second here. Although I think I may have already dropped out. I'm not even seeing my my dude pop in. Hmm. All right. Well, let me just Let's see. Oh, there we are. No. Yeah, no, I, I took control of you. <laughs> yeah, you took control. All right, good. You do that. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, all right. Where content creation is the main purpose of the uh, of the purpose is our how can developers ensure content that is being made lies within the legality of society, terms, and agreements? Well, that, again, is the same kind of question in a way. Uh, it's a question of governance. Governance is the most interesting question to ask about online platforms, virtual worlds, uh, multiplayer online games. Uh, where exactly does the governance uh, of the social action that goes on, where, where does the legitimate governance come from? Does it come from a maker, or the, the game maker, and then people just vote with their feet by deciding to play it or not? That's the kind of market answer to say that. Does it come from some kind of governmental entity, right? Uh, that's, that's another solution. Uh, or you can look at the example of something like CCP, Makers of EVE Online, who remarkably made the decision to cede some of their sovereignty, right, their control over the game, to a uh, uh, the Council of Interstellar Management, a group of players who uh, are allowed to, seemingly allowed to audit the company's uh, handling of the game, their management of EVE Online. Um, although there are some questions about whether that really, really does happen. Um, so there's, it's, it's a complicated situation. Now, let me put it in a different in different terms, which is another way I see these questions, uh, the, uh, framing these questions, is that these online spaces, and this applies to social media and online games and multiplayer and, and all the rest, that they are essentially public spaces, civic spaces in a way. And if they're civic spaces, uh, what what do we decide uh, as a society? about whether civic spaces uh, can exist or should exist within privately controlled, um, uh, under the control of, of private entities like corporations, right? That That is, in essence, a debate that's going on today as to whether something like Facebook should be regulated as utility or not. What is the relationship between the, the clearly public civic space that it controls uh, and its um, rights as a private corporation or private entity. Uh, so those are, there's no automatic decision uh, about how we should solve that question, uh, except in as much as democracy helps us solve that question. You, you see what I'm saying? We can decide through democracy whether we want the government to regulate, whether we want there to be independent certifying kinds of uh, uh, boards or commissions, uh, whether we want to cede a lot of control to these companies themselves, it it gets very complex very quickly. And someone like Jack Hammer has asked a similar question. Compare game creators governing their games versus a team in charge of a social media website like Twitter. Does each group of people have the same responsibilities to society to moderate content on their platform? You know, again, it, some of this becomes a policy position or an opinion, right? Versus what the science or scholarly research tells us. Scholarly research does not, in my opinion, uh, shouldn't do anything more than demonstrate with some clarity what is the relationship between what we're seeing and different kinds of policy prescriptions, right? Uh, so I would suggest that the evidence of democratic society over the last couple hundred years, and then recently with the rise of the internet, the evidence suggests that if you leave things in uh, questions about civic participation uh, under entirely private control, you don't get the kinds of outcomes uh, for civic life that democracy, um, that are in accordance with the values uh, of democracy. Is that, a, is that a clear answer? I hope that's a clear answer. Um, so, where scholarship comes in is to kind of show that a lot of these uh, questions uh, can't be simply solved 
by appealing to a um, private control uh, kind of market-based solution. Let me see what other, what other, there are so many here. Great to see them all. Uh, I'm sorry if I, I'm not getting to all of them. But I'm just keep plowing away. Is this all right with you, Crystal Lee? I, yeah. I, yeah, a hundred percent. Um, I, uh, go for it. I mean, if you want me to jump in at any time, I'm happy to, but otherwise go for yeah. it and don't worry about missing stuff. This is like the standard for the class, right? So it's like, we always yeah, do it in right. Twitch. There's 200 people here. Everybody this knows yeah. we do last what we can. A, last time there weren't as many questions. And so you had mentioned to me that this group is really on the ball and it's great to see. This is, uh, this is a great group. Do you foresee more games like Second Life with so much user freedom being successful in this generation where a lot of things are sensitive? What are the potential risks that developers would face with giving so much liberty to users today? Well, again, that's it's the same kind of, of issue. There's probably another way to put that is perhaps the evidence seems to suggest that there's a limit to how much uh, a, an almost entirely market driven approach to uh, civil participation in digital life, uh, there's a limit to how much that can be successful before uh, certain things become threatened that, that maybe we don't want threatened, right? Like uh, civic institutions themselves, democracy itself, uh, the legitimacy of uh, free in the the results of free in So I'm just going to take a bit of a tangent here, but I do think it's very salient in the current moment where there's so much discussion about trust of public institutions and trust of uh, claims of science, for example. John Dewey, who was the most famous American at his time for almost 40 years uh, in American life, uh, was a, a pragmatist philosopher and had a lot to say about what makes uh, a liberal democracy like the United States work. And he always said very consistently that at the foundations of, of what makes democracy work for creating a stable society uh, is free inquiry, by which he, he means basically academia, the, the opportunity protected by tenure to ask critical questions about how things are and how things could be, to look at evidence and to creatively uh, learn, um, especially facts that might be inconvenient or might contradict what our biases might uh, suggest, that if we don't have that, Dewey says, democracy itself is will be greatly threatened, right? <clears throat> uh, so when we're thinking about uh, these kinds of questions about our online lives, our increasingly digital lives, so many of which are um, in spaces controlled by private entities, uh, we, we see the evidence that a um, that even the legitimate claims of the institutions of uh, research, research institutions, academic institutions, are, can themselves be undermined uh, because of the, um, the reach and the influence, the ability to shape uh, people's subjective experience and dispositions that online platforms have, right? You see that even in the beginning, things like Second Life back in the day, but now it's in a much more developed uh, period of time in 2021 in the last five years with people's lives being uh, saturated by uh, what social media platforms uh, tell them about the world. Um, okay. Small question about governance and coding control. Would the fact that the developer introduces contingency in the game also come under governance because they are deciding to code government? Absolutely. That's a really smart question, I would say, PRS348, uh, because it's easy to imagine that governance is all about constraints. There's actually a legal scholar, uh, Susan Crawford, who uh, wrote very interestingly about this. But it's very easy <coughs> to assume that to govern is to set constraints on action. In fact, that's quite a um, classically liberal way of thinking about governance, again, going back to John Locke. Uh, but in fact, governance occurs, and she's able to show this, um, through the combination of what constraints are, are put in place, but also what possibilities are provided by governmental action, possibilities for action, right? So think of it in a very simple term with the following example. Uh, when the government provides for transportation infrastructure, and this is an observation that goes all the way back to Adam Smith, 
When the government provides for infrastructure and invests in infrastructure, it is not simply generating constraints. I mean, obviously, in a way it is. It's telling where you where you can't drive, <laughs> right? By setting curbs on the roads or maybe concrete barriers and other things like that. But it's also creating possibilities for where you can go, right? When maybe you couldn't before. Built a bridge. Now you can go across the bridge and you couldn't go across the bridge before. So the creation of possibilities that is contingent on uh, is as much a part of governance as constraints. So, uh, it's part of the reason why on online platforms uh, they rely so heavily on game design principles to make for conditions uh, in which people feel they can um, engage in creative social action, right? Uh, well, that's a classic governance challenge. You don't want, you want to encourage innovation, encourage um, creativity. Well, that means not just creating constraints, but creating uh, possibilities as well, right? When Abraham Lincoln establishes the land grant colleges, uh, including the University of Wisconsin, uh, it's done with full awareness that you are uh, increasing the possibilities for the students who will be attending those those schools. So they, you will be broadening their horizons. You will be uh, showing them the the possibilities, the arbitrariness of their preconceptions, uh, and all of that is opening more ground for contingent outcomes rather than simply foreclosing them. Great question. So actually, I want to point out a question um, just because it does tie into a couple of the other lectures we've had this um, this semester. But somebody asked earlier if um, in terms of educational games, you think that something very open world like um, <clears throat> similar to Second Life is better or if you have a thing where it's more task oriented, where the, the code is much more controlled, if that is better. Um, for educational games? Oh, another great question. You know, I often think about this and, and think about the role of universities in American life uh, as, as they become a, a site for uh, substantial public participation, right? So again, with the land grant uh, universities in the first post-Civil War period in the United States, you get this huge opening up of the opportunity to go to college. The, the college itself as an environment which is both structured and contained, it has constraints, but is also a place for free exploration, it is very much like designing a game, right? Universities are game-like in that way. There are boundaries, right? There are things you aren't supposed to do, but you're also supposed to have an enormous amount of free play within that. Um, and I think something similar applies to educational software. Uh, I think pedagogically, Anyone who does this for a living, and Crystal Lee, I don't know if you agree or not, but I would tend to think that we recognize very quickly that there is a productive sweet spot uh, between constraint and freedom. Uh, Stravinsky, the great composer, uh, famously said no that he feels least not this paralyzed scene. if there's so too much possibility on a commission he receives to compose a piece. But if the people who give him the commission say, no, we want you to use a voice choir and a harp and uh, three violins and, and 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 a snare drum. Suddenly, he can feel creative. You know, as long as it's not too restrictive, it's that sweet spot in between of okay, all right, we've brought the pos the scope of possibilities into a manageable size uh, through constraints. So, my answer to educational software is that uh, it is let's put it this way: it is just as easy to go wrong by providing too much possibility as to go wrong by providing too much. Too much constraint. Oh yeah, I 100% agree. Um, in fact, honestly, when I was, you know, in my first, say, like year or two ish of teaching, um, that was something that I messed up a few times making assignments. Uh, right? Like I would teach a writing class, and I'd be like, I don't care. You just need to write well. Write about whatever you want. And then I'd have a classroom of students going, but I don't know. I I don't know anything. Right. There's nothing right. I can write about. I know nothing. I am Jon Snow. And, that's, right. and then I learned very quickly um, that, that constraints are absolutely necessary. There's a wonderful moment in the, uh, one of the beat poets, one of the best beat poets from the 50s and 60s was Frank O'Hara, who was a curator at the Museum of Modern Art and, and wrote poems on his lunch hour of things. And he writes an amazing poem. It's actually about the day he learned that Billie Holiday died. It's called The Day Lady Died, if anyone wants to look that up. But I always think of it because it has this incredible line in it where he's, He's about, he's, on, he's thinking ahead of what he's going to be doing that weekend before he finds out. 
and he's going to go to somebody's house. He's, he needs to buy a gift for one of their kids who has a birthday. And he goes to a store. And he's rushing on one show to buy a gift. And he finally tells you what he finally decides to buy. After he says, after practically falling asleep from quandary, right? There's just too much possibility staring at that wall of things you could buy for this kid. You know, that it's paralyzing or, or stultifying, right? You just, well, I have no idea, right? Um, by the way, uh, Phoebe Bridgerton asks, has my paradigm on creations changed since this article's been published? You still think that there are the four that you described based on the second line or have other games you different? Well, I, I wanna, I wanna uh, say that I chose those for convenience, right? I'm, I'm very pragmatic in my approach to the theories that we bring to bear on our material. So that was four ways of carving up that empirical material to make it manageable, coherent, and digestible. But there was nothing magical or, you know, like uh, transcendent about that way of organizing it. Um, I, I'm not, I wouldn't feel wedded to it if I were to write that kind of article again, right? A different circumstance may call for being divided up in, in more ways. It's a way to kind of disaggregate a messy reality according to a scheme that uh, isn't sort of ultimately true with a capital T, but helps your reader make sense of the material you're trying to communicate about. Uh, let's see. In Coding Control, I talk about how Second Life demonstrates how an open-ended and user-manipulable virtual environment is just a constituted mutual remaking yes, for both parties of control of the game. Do you think it is important for all games to not only be designed by the creators, but also give users the freedom to manipulate or create things in the game as well? Well, I, you know, I don't know. I, I wouldn't say that. I, I think that there's a... You know, I'm very, uh, what's the word, um, uh, ecumenical <laughs> about uh, the games that I, I like to see made, right? I think that there's a place for games that are uh, very tightly scripted and that are kind of uh, strongly narratively driven where you get a very clear sense of the game designer's point of view, right? And then maybe what's interesting about the game is the extent to which you as a player uh, feel railroaded and and unsatisfied or feel like you are being taken on a journey that is kind of interesting because it's not the journey you would choose. Um, I do think that games that are more uh, linear uh, and, and maybe forced, I suppose is the word uh, that applies in that sense, are, are often are, are often better um, structured as single player games. Uh, whereas I think to have a multiplayer game is, is already to invite uh, or to, to value what the players find meaningful together and have what they consider to be significant as sort of part of the scene. Um, so, so yeah, I would, that would be my answer to that. I don't think. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say to throw in a little context, and I'm not sure because I, I missed I missed the screen name. Um, but I harp hard on agency in the design classes. And I know that there's a handful of people here who've taken the design class with me already. Um, and that is the, the idea of agency there is very strongly informed by your yeah, ideas of agency. agency. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, there, there's a way in which, you know, at, at the, at the, at some threshold, a lack of performative agency on the part of the player makes something ceases to be a game, right? Uh, and then you're really, you know, it's more sensible as uh, something more like film, right? Where someone is taking something in that they don't really get to change in a meaningful way. So attending to that agency is, a, is an extremely important task for any game designer. But I, I, was, I was trying to say is that there's a range of how much agency players should, should look to experience across different games, but obviously not not so much. They shouldn't have so little agency that they just feel like they're they're like a procedural um, uh, function, <laughs> just sort of you know clicking things like a like through a procedure. Then suddenly you're you're you're, you're bureaucratic well, that's one uh, trinket, uh, entity, if you will. Three trinkets. Yeah, I just wanted to let you know that they they have at least some of them have that background of your ideas on agency. I gotcha. Yeah, uh, let's see if we can this one. 
Uh, let's see, what, look at what else we have here. That when it comes to user development in a game like this, like for Minecraft, how can developers keep a positive and communicative relationship with their players and what they can create, while also being able to moderate and restrict mm. certain dangerous content players can make? Is it possible to find a perfect balance between giving players freedom mm. while also being able to ban those who break any developer-created guidelines? I think that is the that's the biggest challenge, right? Um, and it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's actually a challenge of what's called in the social sciences political legitimacy right if that's why these are governance questions think about and I, 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 don't, I hope this doesn't strike you as too ambitious of, a, of an analogy but think about uh, any uh, government any state entity right and like a national government the success or the stability and a bit, some combination of stability and, and, and happiness of it um, of its people, it rests on the question of whether they can govern legitimately, right? Whether they are held to be uh, legitimate in the decisions they make when they set a constraint, for example, when they say no, when the government says no, you can't, you know, drive uh, across somebody's property, you know, or you can't yell fire in a crowded movie theater, which is a nice example for certain reasons, that that is a legitimate check on personal freedom, right? How is that legitimacy established? Well, the, the, the answer is that legitimacy is a process. It's not established because you wrote the perfect constitution or set conditions up in a perfect way. It's a process of gaining uh, that legitimacy in the eyes of, of the governed, right? The same process I would suggest applies to game designers mm -hmm. where uh, it is a process. It's not that you set it, you just, if you could just set everything up perfectly, all the terms of service and all the architecture and all the rules and everything, then you won't have to worry about whether you're, you're seen as legitimate in the eyes of your players or not. You automatically are. No, um, it's every, you are only as legitimate as your last decision almost in a certain way, right? You've got, it's a process of continual uh, dialogue between the makers of the game and the players. Uh, so unfortunately, that means there's no automatic answers about where these thresholds should be. Uh, I think recognizing the need for that dialogue, recognizing that players are content generators, that they have some legitimate claim uh, on the content that is made within a, a, a game creator's uh, sandbox rather than holding to, again, a strict Lockean contractarian view of it, which would say, well, no, you know, the um, Blizzard owns the sandbox that's World of Warcraft, so all the human effort that's put into it uh, to create characters, doesn't matter, Blizzard gets to own everything at the end of the day. I think that that rather rigid view, that, that zealous uh, contractarian view on the part of a game developer is going to work against um, well, and and foreclose the possibility of uh, generating a, a legitimate um, uh, relationship, a relationship of, of governance to this group with the players. The last. I think they may still be down here. I should probably get them out. All right. Nothing scares away the tourists like a rotting corpse. Well, a lot of a lot of questions. I think they're covering similar territory, so I, I'm I'm kind of scanning through them uh, with that in mind. Follow up to Xping's question. Do you think said virtual economies can introduce bias for what is considered marketable by the developers and what is promoted? Absolutely. How can you balance between what is popular and what needs more exposure because it introduces more diversity and will be better for the game in the future? Example is how some video games with skins tend to have later ones that end up being derivatives of an earlier skin. Well, yes. I mean, in this piece, you see exactly that kind of tension. You've got the programmers in Linden Lab who have these. Uh, ideologically driven um, expectations and standards about the aesthetics of Second Life. They want it to be beautiful. They they have this faith in a kind of market-like aggregate action that will somehow generate um, beautiful spaces for the users of Second Life. But uh, as it played out, <laughs> users didn't create spaces that were beautiful to them. Uh, at the same time, the other parts of the Linden Lab company, right, because no company is a monolith, other parts of that company wanted more transactions, more 
profit because uh, Linden Lab was making money off of conversion between real dollars and Linden dollars. So you see the marketing team looking to market Second Life to people who will be consumers in Second Life. Where the program programmers are imagining everyone in Second Life will be a content creator. Uh, so it's a huge tension. Uh, why would we think that the game developers have the right idea about how a game should succeed in being beautiful, right? For example, uh, versus players. But why would we think the players will necessarily find, you know, the right answer uh, for how to how a game can be beautiful too, right? So that's that's the tension that um, that's in play here. I think one of the things that maybe hasn't been said enough in uh, about virtual spaces but was certainly a enormous source of fascination for people who came at it from a marxian perspective is that look at all this effort all this labor that people are producing all the value that that's being produced from that and look who's actually benefiting right this is an old story uh you can look at the music industry going back to the 50s um and what was called payola schemes to get um certain kinds of artists pay uh, played on the radio that the creatives, you know, the people who want to play music, for example, or create content in the game, uh, because they're doing what they want out of passion, and because they uh, are not coming to an arena necessarily with a uh, much knowledge about how to be an entrepreneur, that the creatives are vulnerable to exploitation in, in capitalist terms. Uh, so that happens over and over. Right, and the dance club's question from Stern Boyos is exactly about that. Um, is it com will a commodity market crop up in all games like Second Life, or did the features of Second Life lend themselves to this? Yes, the features of Second Life did lend themselves to that in a in a specific way, which is that provision of intellectual property rights to your creations meant it generated an enormous incentive on the part of content creators in Second Life to make things and sell them. Uh, within Second Life, because they own the property rights to any particular design. Um, so, yes, is the short answer. Uh, commodity markets are, it's not, it's not that they can't crop up in other places. I mean, if you look at something like Play Money, which is a book by Julian DeBell about the EverQuest, I think it is, or is it Ultima Online? Ultima Online, in game economy. Uh, commodity markets, they wherever you have a currency, they want to kind of they tend to creep in, and, and sometimes people invent currencies uh, when they don't, when when there isn't one provided. You know, as has happened in several online games. All right, I will take some backseat gaming. If anyone in chat remembers how to get through this puzzle, because I forgot. And boy, there's a real consistent themes in, in these questions about you know, is it is it possible? Are we giving too much freedom uh, to players? You know, and someone mentions Dungeons and Dragons. I think that's actually a really, really interesting example to consider because it's so old and it predates um, the internet, you know, or at least games on the internet, uh, network games, only by a few years, really, if you consider Mud One, but it, it does predate uh, digital game design. And furthermore, I mean, I could really get into the history of this, but D&D owes a lot of its history to a 19th century German game called Kriegsspiel, which is a kind of war game, which very importantly placed the, um, a certain figure who was the, the arbitrator, I've forgotten the name, the name for this guy, uh, but is not a player of the game, it's the person who basically makes all the judgments uh, about what's happening, what would be plausible, would those armaments arrive in time for that Napoleonic, you know, uh, um, battalion, etc. cetera. Uh, so, so d and is really fascinating because it preserves this idea of this quote unquote impartial figure and, and then it's reinvented in this figure of the dungeon master so that even when d and was first being played and I was on the scene for that, I was playing it in Minnesota in 1976, um, that even back then there was this tension between whether the game designer was establishing hard rules or whether they were providing guidelines and the dungeon master, this kind of descendant of the Kriegspiel dungeon game master, whether the dungeon master had ultimate authority. See, it's a governance question again. 
So that's an old solution to this problem. And that solution is to say, at the end of the day, your local table and your local dungeon master gets to change anything that they want, and you have to live with that, right? That is almost impossible to create in most online games. Now, I suppose, I don't know a lot about Minecraft, but I suppose that in Minecraft, the, the a degree of sovereignty, if you will, over different servers on which Minecraft runs could be analogized to dungeon masters and their sovereignty over their table, right? Where uh, you get this kind of much more local and, and kind of human and unalienated and uncommodified relationship between someone setting the terms of how a game works and the community playing it rather locally. Again, you see, you see the analogy. Um, so that, that's a, it's a nice example to think as against uh, these kind of online games that um, have a set architecture, right? Where there's not an expectation that players or even some local authority, like a dungeon master type server owner in Minecraft, uh, games where, like Second Life, where there's no suggestion that some local authority gets to set the terms of what happens, gets to tinker with the code, gets to tinker under the hood. I think it's a great question. You know, Second Life um, experimented, they toyed with the idea of creating islands that had some amount of this degree of sovereignty, some limited control over behind the scenes, backstage settings uh, within the engine itself, right? And that would be a similar kind of idea to what this question's getting at. Um, the question concludes, do you think it's better to keep as much of that freedom for the players or to funnel it into the aesthetic aspiration of the original idea of Vision of Dragons? Like, well, you know, it's so funny how quickly we get to policy questions. Is it better to do this or better to do that? Uh, it, I think all, all scholarship really can do is show you how the different attempts play out, you know, and what kind of problems they run into. Uh, so as a game designer, I think it's, it's a question of not like some academic is going to give you the, the right answer. Oh, no, always do this. <laughs> so much as, well, you know, it depends. If you do this, beware, you might end up doing too much of that or doing making that choice might run you into those problems. So I hope that's not too, uh, too wishy-washy of an answer. what else do we have here is there a time when too much freedom would be bad yes uh let me give you another example i didn't realize the class was so anti-freedom well or or, or are they pro-freedom and they're kind of pushing to understand that you know hey why would it be a problem to give people too much freedom um you know it comes down to are there any potentially bad consequences to so-called free expression, right? I mean, the classic example of this is yelling fire in a crowded movie theater. Should there be laws that restrict certain kinds of expression, right? Um, similarly, really, you can look at the history of the United States and arguments for states' rights, right, which were essentially arguments to uh, in favor of uh, allowing more local autonomy so that uh, states would be free to enact things like Jim Crow laws, right? Uh, which is what happened. So states' rights was a, was a kind of veneer claim uh, in almost every case for more ability to control um, uh, access to the vote and, and not just the vote, uh, the, the public rights, uh, civil rights of African Americans predominantly. Whereas, you know, that the figure of the federal government um, in the 14th Amendment comes in and says, no, after the 14th Amendment, we are claiming the right to step in if constitutional rights are violated within a given state. And that is a huge shift, right? That shifts an enormous amount of kind of trump card power, uh, forgive the expression, to the federal government. Um, so you're, you're up against a similar kind of um, issue here uh, when it comes to uh, being a game designer, right? Can you give too much freedom to players? Yes, they can do things that are problematic, right? Uh, players, let's remember, not a single one of them is some unencumbered modern self who comes out of with no baggage, with no bias, with no cultural, uh, culturally shaped dispositions. Everybody comes into this world always already from a particular cultural and historical point of view, one which is often shaped by race, by class, 
by gender, by sexual orientation. So the idea that you know, freedom, more freedom provides more opportunity for people to, in this kind of heroic modern way, simply express their, their innocence, unencumbered selves and, and make their way to a better world is not supported by the evidence. Instead, what happens is that often certain kinds of privilege get preserved through all of the things that go without saying that become protected as sort of just free, uh, free action uh, when it's re really structural discrimination of one sort or another, often to the extent that people don't even realize they're, they're engaging in, in actions that support certain kinds of exclusion. So that would be my reason why it's possible, yes, for there to be too much freedom in any social space. Uh, and it also gets back to that idea of, are there public spaces? Is there, uh, is there a problem when uh, pub things that have become public spaces uh, exist under private control? Uh, do we need to rethink uh, the fact, uh, our, our governance, um, based on the fact that so many of these privately constructed spaces are actually um, governed by uh, that they're governed by private entities, they, but they become public spaces, spaces for civic, civic action. There's a lot of complicated law in this area too, things about public accommodation type places versus others. And if, if anyone takes a constitutional law class, you can get into some very interesting distinctions on a lot of these, these fronts. Uh, okay, what else? I, I am so far behind. I'm, I'm skipping way down here to try and get a little bit more current. Do it. Holy cow, there's so many. All right, I'm just going to go to what's, what's new. Um, oh, so this is good. People are mostly just talking to each other. Like I like that. They are. Uh, they will also get credit for answering each other's questions. Good, good, good. Uh, all right, so Sheriam Taneha says, sometimes uh, players find ways to use mods in games in which they are not allowed, which can be worse than officially allowed mods, though. Uh, through which the developer can control what effect mods have on the game. Do you think allowing player-based content or mods in the game is a good idea from a security perspective, especially multiplayer player games or having a level playing field is important? Wow. Ooh, level playing field. That's a conversation. Yeah. See, I, it, isn't it interesting how ethics are always on the scene? There's an anthropologist named Michael Lambeck who uh, wrote a book called The Ethical Condition not that many years ago now. And in it, he makes the argument that we don't get to choose the context in which we are called upon to be ethical and when we're not. Uh, we are ethical just by being human. I always think of Charles Barkley, this is a long time ago, back when Charles Barkley was a player. And I think he was for Reebok, it was, it was his brand. And there was a commercial for Reebok. And the commercial begins with him talking, uh, this voiceover, and he says, I am not a role model, right? That idea that one can choose, one can claim as a kind of free citizen under this kind of Lockean notion of liberty, one can choose to not be held accountable for the messages one, one, uh, one's behavior uh, sends, right? Uh, that, that to me is is problematic, right? Uh, when you look at the evidence of how human society works, we inevitably influence each other ethically. We are we can't we can't sort of jettison the um, the responsibility that accrues from being human beings uh, behaving uh, in concert with other human beings, right? So uh, I think that part of the reason why. Uh, the level playing field idea is really interesting because I think people refer to that in the context of games to try and reintroduce some idea that, hey, isn't there an ethical frame around this, right? Um, but I think the, the limitations of level playing field often have to do with, well, wait, you know, what what is the competition? What what are the what are the measurements for success? It gets extremely complicated in games like take World of Warcraft, where in the early days of World of Warcraft, it seemed like there was one metric for you know success for competition, you know, a scoreboard essentially, uh, which was progressive ratings. But as the game developed and as they increased 
sort of support for other ways of playing the game, especially around like mini paths and mini games and a whole bunch of other ways of playing the game and PvP and other things like that, then level playing field becomes a much, much harder question to ask. Level playing field for what? Is it is it for for raiding? Is it for something else? Right? So um, I, I, I applaud the way in which thinking about a level playing field uh, directs us to the idea that there seems to be something ethically troubling when people ex make use of exploits within a game, right? Uh, but what I think is, is a better label for what's going on is that we are ethical uh, actors, whether we like it or not, uh, and behaving in ways that suggest we can uh, just sort of shrug off any call to be ethical um, in a space in which other people are also uh, acting is, is is kind of the problem, right? That's that's a modern a modernist ideological dodge that I Just think it's you can not hard to demonstrate. Does it mean you um, should? Is a problem. Our intrepid trio may not give this kind of size a, a second. It is a good answer. So uh, that that question. Uh, caught my interest because back in the early days of World of Warcraft, when I was writing my master's thesis on it, um, within the player uh, like forums and whatnot, there was a lot of discussion using this terminology of a level playing field to talk about how um, using mods or bots, which were considered cheating, was ethical because adults who have full-time jobs need a level playing field with children who right. don't and therefore have more time to play. And so there was this idea of there's not a level playing field because of life. It gets extremely complicated. Yeah, I just recently had a wonderful conversation with uh, an activist here in Milwaukee who is uh, working very hard about accessibility in games. And uh, there you get another similar kind of question, which is that for some people who have certain kinds of disabilities, certain kinds of workarounds and certain kinds of mods are what enable them to participate at all. Mm -hmm. um, so is that, is that cheating? Is it not? These aren't easy, easy uh, questions to answer. Um, all right, let me see what else is being said here. Um, Back a little bit here. So while you're reading, Endless Nine mentions that it's more of an argument if it wasn't for all the gold sellers. Um, but it is it or is it not, right? So if somebody is like. It, I mean, I didn't do this, but let's say I, you know, I was working full time while I was playing WoW, and I didn't have that kind of time to grind gold, right? So if I go and buy gold from a gold seller, how is that? Why, why are you saying that that would be different than if I what scripted my own bot and did it? Um, we actually had a, a Chinese gold farmer in our guild for a while. It was kind of fascinating. Did they happen to read Julian DeBell's piece on gold farming for the New York Times magazine? This class? Yeah. No. Um, oh, I, that's that is that's as good as it gets. It's a great, great piece. Um, it is, I, I agree. It's still available on his website. Um, so CMR, Mr. 98, if I'm sort of parsing that in a helpful way. Dr. Malvin, Code Control, you speak about content as a developer's product in which users are exposed to scripted content that is in some ways independent of the game's engine, right? Like with the new Atoll-shaped uh, continent that they put into Second Life. What is your take on the extent of game developers' biases that can be embedded into gaming content? And how do you think gamers or game developers should address this? Yeah, I think it's it's one of the things that I find most important to recognize. I think there's a there tends to be, and I identify it in my other work uh, with a, with a particular history in the United States. There tends to be a kind of um, what I call techno liberal. Uh, I associate it with engineering, uh, a mindset that that suggest that we don't have to, as, a, as an engineer or a developer, a programmer, I have full awareness and full control of, of what I'm doing. I don't have any biases, right? It's uh, that unencumbered myth of the unencumbered self again. And uh, I think that 
we do a lot better, and I think a lot of the pure gaming and, and other game development coming from different points of view has really helped shine a light on this. We do a lot better when uh, we recognize that uh, no game developer gets to um, know everything they're writing into their code without without awareness. Right? Like, uh, they are always going to be scripting certain kinds of assumptions that they have into the code that they write. Get out of my mind. Uh, Wait, no. And that's Get going to have effects. There's always a, let's put it this way, every programmer, certainly every game designer slash programmer who's working in the digital environment, is going to be working from a particular picture of the human, well, picture of what human beings are all about. It wasn't the and that picture of the human is money. always going to be coming from a particular blood pressure point medication. of view. And often it's a strangely kind of modernist, a cultural point of view. As well, I hope that's a helpful question. It sounds like everybody from these questions has has gotten, uh, you know, what some of the important points from the for that particular article <clears throat> has has grasped grasped those uh, quite well. The ways in which the architecture of any online environment is informed by the particular point of view of its makers um, and the ways in which there's a, a constant process of co-creation going on between uh, platform creators and users. Um, and that's all great. Great to see. Any other questions? Oh yeah, coming out simulator. So I don't think I've played this game, but I'm happy to to, to riff as best I can. Um, and, and for more to you, Crystalie, maybe for that. Um, well, so you know what might help is, is if I tell you why I um, why I sign that with your article, and that is that coming out simulator. First of all, you should try it. It's a very short game. You can get through it in like 15, 20 minutes. Um, okay. It's really, really good. Actually, Josh introduced me to it. Uh, yeah, and I feel like I must have seen it on Lunchstone. I'm just not able to recall it. Somewhere. Probably. Um, but it, in a like very literal sense, um, because of the coding, and be, which m essentially mimics uh, social constraints, um, you don't have a lot of control. right? So you play as Nikki. This game is obviously very autobiographical. I can talk today. Not enough coffee. Um, and there, there's there's so many things that like as I'm playing, there's so many choices I want to make, and there's so many um, things that I want to do that I can't. Um, and of course, that makes right. sense because socially, right. the things I want to do are coming from a very so privileged position of not a being a homosexual here. Asian male well, living in Canada with traditional parents. And Even so the, the, the game the gives this very literal sense of control and constraint. Um, yeah. While also using that to to make this point about social constraints and choices that people have or, or don't have um, in their Absolutely. life. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, just consider it as the difference between uh, what happens when something like Second Life. What's the difference, right, between something like Second Life, which is created and I really do mean this, with great sincerity by its makers, like without, like, uh, what's the word, naively, you might even say. So the Linden Lab developers were, and I was there, you know, I was in their offices while all this was going on, they were, they didn't even raise to themselves the question that they might be coming to their project from a particular cultural point of view. It was not an imaginable truth for them. So that means that their inscription of their values into the game was done, you know, uh, unintentionally. Whereas something like Coming Out Simulator, and I just Googled some images to remind myself of it, uh, is, is using the awareness on the part of the designer that in controlling game architecture, you can script certain kinds of assumptions into the game. You can, 
create an encounter between the designer's cultural point of view and the player's cultural point of view and leveraging that for artistic purposes, right? To challenge expectations. Second Life was not trying to challenge expectations, really. They thought, really, they thought their picture of the human was the right one. And actually, this is one of the major follow-ups from this piece that I ended up writing a bit more about, but I had been looking it over today, I realized I didn't quite come out and say it. But think how strange it is that this developer in San Francisco wanting to create the, what would they imagine, I mean, they dreamt big, be the three-dimensional version of the web, right? They thought they were doing it. This is going to be everything. How strange it is that they felt that the, the um, how peculiar it is that the tools, the only tools they felt were necessary to make that gigantic dream happen were the same tools that a content creator gets for a video game. Think how bizarre that is, how narrow that is, right? And I say in the piece that they didn't script any, any tools for creating other kinds of content, right? Like creating a breast cancer survivor support group, right? Uh, they, they were working from a picture of the human that was completely embedded in engineering and specifically game design. And they felt that every possibility anyone could ever need for society at large was contained in that content developer's toolkit. And that's what they provided players. Consider the difference between that as a kind of bizarre picture of the human informing that code and what Coming Out Simulator does, where the developer is not at all expecting that their user shares their point of view. In fact, they're counting on the fact that their user doesn't in order to create a much more interesting um, and challenging of expectations uh, experience between those those two points of view. I think that's a, a very stark difference, and it's one that you could map on to many digital environments in which we spend our time. Um, so we could probably do one more question, but then that's it. We are at about six minutes left in class. Oh, Taco Cat has definitions in relation to the other curricular class instead of this one, like the definition of what a game is. Well, Crystalline knows I can talk about that forever, but I don't know if I'd want to subject her to that. She's heard me talk about that way too many times. <laughs> well, and also, Taco Cat, I know you were here for this too. That's literally what we spent half of the class talking about while uh, Mark Chen was here. I've been down here so long, I just want my stuff back. I left the water bucket upstairs. Sorry, I'm not helping you, Crystal. That's okay. <laughs> I'm, you know, I, I, I can see that, you know, with the sweet bird of gamer youth is, is taking flight from me as I'm, uh, I can't multitask like I used to. I would argue that um, being that being able to play, stream, and talk at the same time is just a learned skill, um, and it takes a lot of practice. And I've had a lot of practice. You know, I mean, I started streaming yeah. what when I was still your student. Yeah, I think that's right. So you know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I can talk a little bit about stuff that I'm um, I'm writing right now uh, to, to wrap up, if, if, but I don't know that it would... Actually, I think it is relevant to what you're trying to get across with this material. Um, yeah, do it. So I'm just, I just finished a new chapter for uh, what will be the new media anthropology volume published by Routledge. And uh, actually, I'm going to be presenting on it. Uh, at our Twitch symposium, which we're going to be doing in two weeks, uh, the joint uh, stream symposium with um, University of Rivaska, or, uh, the, the Center for Game Culture Studies in Finland. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to have Ryan House handle the stream a game duties while I talk uh, through my piece. Uh, but uh, I hope that uh, the students are aware of it and, and might want to come check it out. Uh, in it, I talk about the ways in which uh, games are, um, think about the difference between a game like Monopoly, where you have to take time setting up the game, where you've got rules that you have to consult, where there are dice to roll, where there are markers to move, 
where there are houses and hotels to manage, money to manage, cars to manage, and, you know, and all the rest. And think about how, as you play that game, it's so explicitly, so obviously contrived, right? You've got to, to make use of dice to, or a shuffled decks of chance cards or something, and they're called that, chance cards, to simulate in some way this idea uh, this and now this metaphor of of becoming a real estate tycoon, right? And I don't think game scholarship has said enough about how transformational it is when you put games into uh, in digital environments and code them, where you get to take those dice and those spinners and those shuffled cards and those markers and those rules and architect all of them, put them into code, and how. The fact that they are just kind of self-evidently true, right? Your your character can't necessarily walk through that boundary, not because the rules say, you know, you're not supposed to go there, but because you actually can't, right? And then when you swing your sword at someone, you don't actually roll dice and see the, see the result as this kind of little explicit little contrived mechanism. It actually can't, it misses, right? Or it hits. Uh, what are the implications of that for how natural or real games feel to us? Uh, what kind of claims do they make about how we approach reality as real? Uh, well, how it shapes our perceptions of reality versus the much, you know, more kind of crude and set up and player effort dependent uh, analog games are. So that's what I'm writing about recently. Um, yeah, so there will actually be a link to that um, in the Discord later. I will only link one conference at a time so they don't all get lost. Um, and right now what's linked in there is I'm giving a talk on um, games and education on Thursday, which will also be on oh, Twitch. Cool. Um, and once that one is done, I will link the Serious Play Symposium because I'm also doing the keynote on at noon. That's right. Well, I, 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 want, I, want, I didn't want to jump the gun and, and, and let everybody know that. But this is the, the first thing I thought of when we thought of this symposium was, well, Crystal Lee has to do a keynote. <laughs> the conference for her to show uh, this amazing ability she has. So it's the 17th and 18th, and uh, I won't give any more details so that you don't get distracted. Yeah, I mean, and that, and that, will, be, that will be linked. Um, uh, like I said, in the Discord, so you won't have to worry about finding it. It's all on Twitch and it's all on free. Same with this Thursday, although I think that's already linked. Um, it's on Twitch, so that's all free. Um, that's it. It's 3.45, so class is done. Thanks, guys. A little slow to start here, but it's cool. I get it. It's been a long semester. Um, well, I was amazed by the avalanche of questions. I'm sorry I only got to a few of them. It sounds like it was helpful for you all, so that makes me happy. Um, and uh, feel free to email me, any of you, if you've got follow-up things you're curious about in relation to what I study and talk about, I happy to hear from you. Um, if it makes anybody feel better, we only have two more lectures and then class is over. Uh, I don't know how it works out, but we end our semester in April. I know that's sooner than you do. Yeah, that's, that's much sooner than us. That's I know. Dramatic. Yeah. I honestly don't know how that happened, but it's a thing. So yeah, to the class, take heart. Two yeah, more weeks of lecture. Stretch. That's right. Yeah. And in chat, someone's saying, damn, didn't even realize that. I know. <laughs> well, it feels like we started class yesterday. Yesterday lasted five years, and now we're in the final stretch. Um, and that is how time works in the pandemic. All right. Um, yes. Thank you, Dr. Malaby. Thank you to everyone for the great questions. Um, we didn't make it through the mine here, but that's fine. Um, I will see you all next week. We'll, we'll be talking about something. I don't remember because I closed the schedule out when I started the game. Uh, if you have any <laughs> questions, you know where to find me. It is on Discord. Um, and yes, the final stretch does mean the papers. So get on that. All right. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Crystal Lee. Take care.